Good morning, everyone. And thanks for coming to this presentation on uh, over indebtedness and poverty. And this is joint work together with uh, Helena Trebis, who is also here today. So, why are we interested in this topic of over indebtedness? Well, first of all, we saw that uh, there has been a significant increase in household debt um, since about the second half of the 20th century. And this has been the case for, for mo most countries in the West, uh, including for Belgium. And this graph shows uh, some figures for like the, the past decades for, uh, for Belgium, a household debt as a percentage of GDP. And there's a clear increase uh, starting in 1995 at 37.8%, increasing to about 50% around the, the, the timing of the financial crisis, and then further increasing to about 65% uh, today. So basically, household debt has become a natural source of finance for private households, has also been um, theoretically um, included in, in so-called life cycle hypothesis and the permanent income hypothesis. Households tend to use household debt as a way to smooth consumption over the life cycle. They borrow when income is low and they repay the debt when income gets higher. Um, and also the figures for Belgium clearly show that uh, household debt is indeed quite um, broadly spread across the population and there has been a, a small increase. So if we compare uh, figures for 2010 and 2020, we see that um, the share of individuals living in a household that owns some type of debt has increased from 55 to about 60%. Um, and among those households who own some type of debt, about half only have mortgage debt, a quarter only has non-mortgage debt, and then another quarter has both types of debt. And not only the, the share of people owning debt has increased, but also the outstanding amounts or the, the initially borrowed amounts um, have increased. And again, we see that there has been a particularly increase in, uh, in mortgage debt um, related, of course, to the, the low interest rates of the last uh, years. Now, although um, household debt has, or is today this, this cornerstone of uh, household finance, it is argued that it's necessary to monitor that indebtedness does not spiral out of control, as over-indebtedness can have, or has been shown to have uh, negative consequences both at the micro level and the macro level. So at the micro level, households who struggle to repay their debt, they obviously often have financial um, problems, but also uh, the impact appears to be there uh, um, on, on the level of, of uh, our, the impact is also appears to be socially, psychology, uh, psychologically, and even um, like physical health. So people with high debts tend to postpone medical treatment. Uh, so there's also, has also been shown there is an effect there. And also at the macro level, a very high level of um, indebtedness. Um, can cause the financial system to become unstable. Um, and as we have seen in the financial crisis, of course, can even have an impact on the overall economy. Now, in the literature, there is not really a generally accepted definition of what is exactly over uh, indebtedness. And as a consequence, there have also been several types of indicators that have been used to, to measure this concept. And in general, we can um, distinguish sort of three types of indicators. The first are so-called administrative indicators. So these are really indicators that are extracted from, for instance, judicial procedures, such as a number of people on debt settlement. But the issue with that type of indicator is that, of course, these procedures, they differ across countries. So cross-country um, analysis is really difficult uh, using those indicators, and even across time if there are changes in the procedures in a, in a country. Then you have uh, a broad set of objective indicators. They try to evaluate the extent to which debt is sustainable by looking at whether households are able to repay their debt. So think about the debt to income ratio, where generally the threshold is put at um, 300%, so your debt should not be higher than three years of your income. 
Uh, the debt to asset ratio is generally, uh, the threshold is 75%. Uh, that's debt service to income ratio, so what you have to repay as a percentage of your income. Uh, the threshold there is usually 30%. And as sometimes also uh, indicators used in, in terms of the number of loans that people have. And of, uh, usually there, the threshold is set at four or more loans. And then finally, sometimes also subjective indicators are used, which really uh, uh, ask our households themselves whether they feel over-indebted by asking, for instance, whether they experience their debt repayments as a heavy burden or whether they can uh, face unexpected expenses. Now, in this paper, we measure over-indebtedness in the poverty framework. So we basically um, contribute to this set of objective indicators. But we define this uh, capacity to repay of households as households being able to reach a minimally acceptable living standard, in other words, the poverty line, after the debt repayments are fulfilled. And we think the benefit of using this as a, as a threshold is that it's a more ex widely accepted threshold. So for these other objective indicators, as I mentioned before, 300%, for instance, of the debt to income ratio, if I think about my own situation, I just uh, took out a mortgage three years ago, so my, my debt is definitely more, worth more than three years of my income, um, but I don't consider myself to be <laughs> among uh, those with problematic debt. Um, so often these, there are some issues with these, these, um, these indicators that, that it identifies some households as, as having problematic debt, um, while this is not always the case. And secondly, um, we also think that by measuring over-indebtedness within the poverty framework, that it makes the link with, with so, uh, social policy more explicit, and I will come back to that later in the presentation. Now, there have been a couple of previous studies that have um, done this measurement of over-indebtedness in the poverty framework. Uh, among one of them is, uh, is also for Belgium in 2008 but they have used uh, EU silk data. We will use other data which we think are better to measure this concept. So why have there only been a couple of studies so far? Well, partly I think this is due to the fact that the relationship between um, debt and poverty is difficult to entangle as household debt can of course be both a cause and a consequence of poverty. But secondly, it's, as I mentioned before, it's partly also probably partly also due to the fact that for a long time there hasn't been really um, good quality household data that combines information that allows to measure poverty and looks at uh, household debt at the, at the same time. So in this paper we cannot really solve the first issue but we do think we can, we can solve the second issue um, with be better data. So that brings me uh, to the, the data and the methods. So the data that we use come from four waves of the, the Eurosystem Household Finance and Consumption Survey, and we focus on the case study of Belgium. The reference periods of those four uh, waves are for the first wave, the income information refers to 2009, and the debt and assets to 2010, so there's also always a bit of a difference in the, the reference period of income on the one hand and debt and assets on the other. And then for the, the second wave, it's 2013-14, the third wave, 16-17, and the last wave is for 2019-20. Um, the results I will show in this presentation uh, reflect a pooling of those four uh, waves as the, the main patterns are quite similar. But we do have results by wave in the appendix of the paper. Now, the types of debt that are included in our analysis refer, on the one hand, to mortgage debt, both for the house you live in, as well as for other real estate. And on the other hand, also non-mortgage debt, where there are three main categories, so credit card debt, a credit line or overdraft, and a very, sorry, a very broad category of non-mortgage loans. Now, in our indicators, we use information not on the actual amount of debt, but the, so not the stock, but the flows, so what people need to repay to, um, to repay their debt. And unfortunately, this information in the data is not available for uh, two um, groups of those I just mentioned. So for the credit card and the overdrafts, there's no repayment, so no flow information. 
And also what may be important is that in the data there's no information on arrears. So if people do not pay their bills or their taxes, this is not included, um, which is one of them, the main uh, drawbacks, I think, of our analysis. Um, now, people that know the, the HFCS data well, they know that in the data there's only uh, gross income information. And to measure poverty, we need information on disposable incomes. And we um, simulate those disposable incomes using the tax benefit micro simulation model Euromat. Now, another benefit of those data is it not only includes incomes to measure poverty, uh, household debt, but it also includes information on assets. So in our uh, analysis, we can also take into account the, the fact that those house households who have um, debt and that do not, may not have sufficient income to repay those debt, they have the possibility to sell some of their assets in able to make those debt repayments. And I will say more about that in a minute. So our analysis is based on the so-called foster grief torbeke uh, poverty indicators, and we, we mainly use the FDT0, which is the poverty rate, so just the, the share of households in poverty, and the FDT1, which is a poverty gap. So that's the difference between the poverty line and um, the income of the poor households as a percentage of the poverty line, so it's a relative measure. And we look at different, uh, so within those uh, poverty indicators, we use different specifications of the, the term YI. So uh, in the baseline model, it just refers to equivalent household disposable income, as it is usually done uh, to measure poverty. And then we add several other specifications in this paper, uh, in this presentation. I will only mention two, but in the paper we have uh, some additional cases. So the first um, case is then just to subtract from uh, equivalent household disposable income the debt repayments. So this is a DRY here. And then as I mentioned before, we also have a specification where we take into account the fact that those households who have high debt repayments may not have sufficient income to meet those repayments. They have the possibility to sell their assets in order to, uh, to make those debt repayments. So this is then uh, written here. So we subtract the debt repayments here from disposable income and we add um, the, the financial assets, real assets and the main residence you work, uh, you live in, sorry, uh, is only taken into account at its annuity value because you still need a roof above your head. Um, but when you need to sell your assets to be able to make debt repayments, and of course the, the income that you receive from those assets uh, you no longer receive. So that is why we also subtract here the financial and the real, uh, the income from financial assets and the rental income. Once we have done that, we then um, define over indebtedness as uh, the percentage of households that are not poor in the baseline measurement of poverty, but they are poor in uh, either one of those two other specifications. And also those households who, are, who were already poor in the baseline scenario, but their poverty gap, so the difference with the poverty line increases. And these are then the results that we get. So this table shows the, the levels of over indebtedness um, that we measure in those two, two cases, with and without asset leveraging. And I also included here these more uh, traditional objective indicators. Um, and also the overlap between those different indicators. So what is interesting here is that um, the level of over indebtedness that we find without asset leveraging is 13.2% which is relatively close to the 14.8% that we find with this debt service to income ratio higher than 30%, which is probably the most um, correlated with, with our uh, indicator. Um, so basically the overall level of those two indicators is similar, but the overlap between those two is only about 8%. So this means that those indicators they identify the same number of households as having problematic debt, 
but only in half of those cases they really identify the same households as having um, or being over indebted. Once we take into account the asset leveraging, then we find an over indebtedness of 3.6%, and also there the, the overlap between with, the, with that indicator and the, the other over indebtedness indicators is relatively uh, limited. We then looked at um, the social demographics that are, the, that are linked with uh, the, the probability of being over indebted uh, with and without uh, the asset leveraging again. So first, uh, if we do not take into account asset leveraging, we see a clear effect of age. So younger households are more likely to uh, become poor or poorer um, once debt repayments are subtracted from disposable income. Also, uh, lower educated households are more likely to be in that group. Um, then also the single parents. Um, yeah, for tenure status, we both find that owners with a mortgage and tenants have a higher um, chance of uh, being over indebted than those who um, are outright owners of their house, which we of course expected. And then finally, also uh, migrants who were born out in a country outside of the EU also have a higher uh, likelihood of uh, being over indebted. If we then take into account the asset leveraging, some of those effects disappear. So mainly the effect of age disappears. So it really shows that by including asset leveraging, we, um, we take out the, the life cycle effect. Um, also the effect of single parents disappears, but the, the impact of education, uh, tenure status and uh, migrant background, they remain uh, significant. Then those households um, that we ident identify as over indebted, of course, do not only differ by social demographic characteristics. We also wanted to look at um, how do the main building blocks of our indicators differ for those groups. So in this table, we looked at um, some characteristics of income, debt, and assets, and we compare, um, we always compare the median of those not identified as over indebted with those who are over indebted according to that specific indicator. So if we first look at the um, mean equivalized disposable income, we clearly see as we expect of course because we um, measured in a poverty framework that um, disposable income is substantially lower for those um, who are over indebted in our indicators than for those who are not over indebted. This is also the case in the, um, so the last three indicators here, there's also a smaller disposable income, <coughs> sorry, for those who are over indebted compared to those who are not over indebted, but the difference there is smaller. And for the indicator that takes on, that uses the number of loans, it's even the other way around. So there, the disposable income is even higher um, for those considered over indebted according to that indicator. Then we looked at the, the average share of non-mortgage debt in total debt, so basically the, 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 the division of total debt in mortgage and non-mortgage debt. Um, there we find in our indicators that the share of non-mortgage debt is higher for those who are over indebted. Um, and this is not the case, for instance, here in the debt to income ratio or the debt service to income ratio. So there the, the share of non-mortgage debt is considerably lower for those identified as over indebted. Then we looked at the uh, mean interest rate and the mean duration of both types of debt. There's not really a significant difference in the interest rate of mortgage debt. There is a small difference in the interest rate paid on non-mortgage debt. And again, those who are over indebted, they on average at least pay a higher interest rate on non-mortgage debt than those who are not over indebted. And again, we do not f really find this in uh, the other um, objective indicators. 
uh, in terms of the duration of the uh, both mortgage and non-mortgage debt, there's also not really a difference. Then we looked at the mean amounts that are borrowed in terms of mortgage and non-mortgage debt. In our indicators, we do not find a statistically significant difference, so even if there are some differences here in the point estimates, in the paper we have the, the standard errors, there's not really a statistical difference there. There is, however, in the, the more traditional objective indicators. So here in these last indicators, we really see that the mean amounts of both mortgage and non-mortgage debt, they are higher for those who are considered to be over-indebted. And then finally, if we look at the assets that are taken into account for this asset leverage, um, there's also not really um, a s statistical difference um, if we look at the standard errors in particular. So basically what the main message is of this table is that while the, the, the more classical objective indicators, they um, really identify households who initially borrow relatively large amounts of debt as being over-indebted, while our, our indicators more, more point towards having a low disposable income and the incidence of non-mortgage debt and the fact that people need to uh, pay higher interest rates on those non-mortgage debt. So the last part of the presentation now focuses on some policy simulations. So we saw that in the literature, the main focus has been on policies that either try to increase financial literacy, so arguing that mainly um, illiterate, uh, financially illiterate people tend to uh, become over-indebted, so by making them more literate, they, um, this will disagree, de decrease. Sorry. Um, then also on policies that regulate the terms and conditions of loans and consumer credit, and also policies that improve like the, the procedures um, once people really get into to, uh, trouble. And actually the link with social policy is rarely made, so we only found two papers so far. Um, one paper by Angel and Heitzman for EU countries, and one paper by Fisher for the US. And both those papers showed that higher unemployment benefits, they are correlated with lower levels of over-indebtedness. But as I mentioned before, we think that by measuring over-indebtedness in the poverty framework, it makes this link or the potential link with social policy a bit more explicit. And we, we decided to do two policy simulations which focus on those two, two aspects that I just mentioned before. So the fact that our indicators really show that over-indebted households tend to have a low disposable income and they have a higher share of uh, non-mortgage debt. So our first policy reform is to consider the debt repayments in the means test of the social benefit, uh, social assistance benefit in Belgium, so in, uh, in Dutch Leeflon. Um, so in a previous paper, we looked at these specific means tests um, across Europe and we found that in most uh, countries, including in Belgium, this means test takes into account either assets or the income from assets. And by taking this into account, it basically lowers or, um, the benefit or even excludes some people from receiving a benefit if they have too uh, high amounts of assets. And we think that it only seems fair that if you take into account the positive effects of owning assets, it only seems fair that you also take into account the potential negative effects of owning debt. So that is why we simulated in Euromod um, what would be the effect if we would take into account those debt repayments in the means test. And then the second policy reform um, is inspired by work done by credit banks in the Netherlands and also a pilot project that uh, ran in Antwerp last year where over-indebted uh, social assistance clients received a maximum 150 euro per month to pay off um, their debt. And it was only for non-mortgage debt or arrears in that case. Um, we didn't really need to use Euromod for that, so we just simulated that in Stata. So those people who were considered poor after we took into account asset leveraging have a positive amount of non-mortgage debt, they receive this 150 euro per month. If we then look at the levels of over-indebtedness, these are the results. So again, as I mentioned before, without asset leveraging before the policy reform, we find 13.2% as over-indebted. This only uh, marginally decreases to about 
12.9-12.5%. If we do take into account asset leveraging, there is a decrease from 3.6% to 3.2-2.4% in these two reforms. So overall, the, the impact is relatively limited, but of course, the simulations that we've run are only small tweaks in, in the overall uh, policy design. And then finally, although the overall impact may be limited, we do think it's interesting to look at who are those people that are helped by the reforms. So this table looks at some uh, social demographic characteristics, comparing those that are helped um, with those who were initially considered to be over indebted and also compared to the total population. For policy reform one, we mainly find uh, an effect for households that are considered to be an other type of household. So think for instance of three generation households um, and also for migrants who were born outside of the EU um, and also without asset leveraging uh, for tenants. And for policy reform too, this is um, so uh, relatively more often uh, unemployed people are helped by the reform. Again, tenants, um, and if we exclude asset leveraging also the migrants from outside the EU. So to conclude, um, although household debt is currently a natural source of finance for households, um, it is often argued that monitoring over indebtedness is necessary as it can have both um, negative consequences at the micro and the macro level. We looked at indicators that are defined within the poverty framework and we compared them with more classical objective indicators. We find a um, relatively similar overall level of over indebtedness, but uh, the overlap is quite, uh, quite limited. Um, yeah, I forgot to mention that before, but once we uh, run the logit regression of social demographics, we also did that for the, the other um, objective indicators and basically the other objective indicators, the uh, point towards one specific demographic group and our um, poverty related indicators, they tend to capture the, dif the different um, groups into one uh, simulation. And then, um, as I mentioned before, yeah, these classical indicators, they really point towards having high amounts of debt as, as a, uh, a risk factor of being over indebted. And we uh, find more this, this um, low disposable income and the incidence of a non-mortgage debt. So in terms of policy implications, we really think that social policy de design currently hardly considers this uh, potential role of debt. So there seems to be ample room for reform in that regard. We did some small policy simulations, but we definitely think there's more research to be done there. And then finally, if we think about the recent periods in the COVID pandemic, the energy crisis, the Belgian government decided together with the banking sector to allow households to postpone the repayments, but only of mortgage debt. So not really any policy was enacted to tackle um, non-mortgage debt and our results clearly show that if you want to help the most vulnerable households, then you should also look at uh, non-mortgage debt. Thanks very much.